Yat a everybody, Shea Heather Fleming in the and I am the executive director at Change Labs in Tuba City, and I am very pleased to welcome you to our workshop today with um, um, a guest that actually means a lot to us at Change Labs because he's also our board chair, Boo Nigren. Um, but before I hand over the reins to Boo, I want to take this opportunity to tell you all a little bit more about Change Labs and what it is that we do. So first and foremost, you should know that Change Labs is a place that you can go to access creative workspace, tools, resource, and knowledge. And yes, we're located in Tuba City. However, um, due to the pandemic, we're offering a lot of our services virtually. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how you can take advantage of some of the services that we have to offer. So by far and away, the most common question that we get at Change Labs is um, just members of the community saying, how do I start a business? And if that sounds like a question you're asking yourself, um, I have a few resources for you. So first and foremost, every Monday we offer business coaching and you can go to, there's a link here, datastartup.org backslash events and and you go there, you'll see a list of coaches and their expertise, and you can sign up for whoever you'd like to chat with. Each appointment is 90 minutes. And um, the coaches all have varying, varying skills and expertise that they offer you. For example, Jessica Stego, who's one of our more senior coaches, she knows everything about running your business on Navajo. So if you're struggling with registration, or you're not sure whether or not you should register in Arizona and Navajo or just Arizona or just Navajo, or you wanna understand how to access land for your business, Jessica is definitely your woman. Um, whereas if you have questions about setting up a, a bookkeeping system or how to hire a virtual accountant, then I would highly recommend setting up an appointment with Marsha. If you go to nativestartup.org backslash events, we do try and put descriptions of what each coach is especially good at so that you can select who you wanna meet with. We also have um, a business incubator that we run at Change Labs. So every year we're selecting 20 high potential Native American entrepreneurs to enroll in this program. It's a 12 month program. And if you're at the very beginning of your business journey, meeting you know, maybe you have an idea that you want to build or you've started something, but you're not quite sure how to get it to the next step. This might be a great program for you to consider. It's nativestartup.org backslash incubator. And in just a few weeks, we're about to announce who is accepted into the class of 2022. But we're also planning on um, opening the program back up for enrollment in fall this year. So if, start, if you're on the cusp of starting a business or... Um, you have something that you just started or you're pivoting in response to the pandemic, this might be a great program for you to check out. The other significant question that we get at Change Labs, especially in a post-COVID world, is how do I create a website? How do I build my online presence? This is increasingly important in our communities. So there's a few resources we can offer you. The first one I want to point you towards is our design residency program. So we have an in-house graphic designer. Uh, she's Navajo. Her name is Mariah Ashley, and she's available for one-on-one -on -one coaching appointments. She's, I, I believe it's the second and third Thursday of every month. There are also 90-minute appointments. You can sign up for those at nativestartup.org backslash events and just look for um, the, the open studio coaching appointments to set up a time with Mariah. And I would also point you to the Change Labs YouTube channel. There's a link to it on our nativestartup.org backslash resources page. And I'll also post a link in the chat window here shortly. But on our YouTube channel, we have been filming guest speakers and also developing our own content to help entrepreneurs get online. We have um, videos, for example, on how to build a simple Squarespace site. We have um, examples of how to start selling online without building a website. We have, um, I'm trying to think of all of them. There's so many at this point, but there's also some on social media and how to sell through social media. 
So please go and check out those videos too if you're thinking about how to get online and build your online presence. And the last question that is pretty popular at Change Labs is how do I get help running my business? And again, I have a few resources for you here. First off, um, technically our Tuba City co-working space isn't open at the moment. We're planning on reopening, I believe at the end of May, but when we do reopen, when the Navajo Nation <laughs> reopens, this is a place that you can come, you know, consider it your business hub. We have desk space, we have color printing, there's other entrepreneurs there, there's coaches there. It's a place where you can go to get access to tools, equipment, um, knowledge, and also just a place to meet other entrepreneurs in your community. And then secondly, I would also point you towards resrising.org. This is um, a digital tool that Change Labs has developed and that we maintain. And at the moment, we have 630 native-owned businesses listed on Res Rising. So think of it kind of like a digital yellow pages. If you're looking for a Native American accountant to work with, go to Res Rising. If you're looking for somebody who can help you build your website, go to Res Rising. If you're looking for a caterer for your next event, look somebody up on Res Rising and see who's in your community. If you have more questions about Change Labs, our programs, or how you can get involved, um, Marsha is usually the one who's running these workshops. So that's not me in that picture. That's my colleague, Marsha. She's our director of co-working and she's always at our Tuba City space. And she's also usually running this workshop series. There's her email and there's our website um, if you wanna reach out to Marsha. And then a few notes that I wanted to go over before um, I hand it off to Boo. We ask, especially since this is a, a larger group, that everyone stay on mute until prompted. So I haven't asked Boo, but I suspect that throughout his presentation, he might say, does anybody have any questions? Or at the end, he might take questions. Uh, and we just ask everyone to stay on mute until you get that prompt. But in the meantime, we welcome you to type any question that you have in the chat window at any time. And um, if it's an urgent question, I'm sure one of us, one of the change labbers can politely interrupt Boo and say, hey, there's a good question in the chat window. Can we stop and take this question? And we do it this way because um, the session today is being recorded and it's all gonna go up on YouTube. So it's um, for filming and for editing, it's critical for us just to have, um, uh, you, you know, no distractions to the speaker and that all the questions are, are asked um, out loud so that, so that people who are watching the YouTube channel later on will know what question was asked and, and be able to hear Boo's response to it. All right, so with that said, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it over to the fantastic Boo Nigren. I mentioned that Boo is also the board chair at Change Labs, and he um, is probably also prolifically known for running for Navajo Nation vice president in the last election cycle. Um, he's truly one of our up and coming leaders, and we're so excited to have him here with us today. So Boo, if you could share your screen and um, thank you for joining us. Hey, good morning. So uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody this morning. Good morning. So I um, just wanted to say thank you for com coming out to join us today. And it's, it's a real honor to be able to present to everyone listening. I know this was a pretty cool topic that I was asked to talk about, about Native leaders in general, Navajo leaders, and what are your thoughts on <clears throat> how to go about um, uh, how, how, how my journey has been. So um, again, my name is Boo Van Nigren. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into it real quick. Um, uh, so today's presentation, definitely gonna talk about who I am, um, kind of some, some overview on history of Navajo leaders and government and today's challenges and preparing tomorrow's native leaders. So that's kind of the overview of my presentation. And then um, 
So I'm, I'm going to take a few minutes here just to kind of talk about who I am, how, how I've kind of come to be. So again, um, uh, thank you very much for everyone for joining today and listening in and just to see, talk a little bit about my journey as well too. So um, I grew up on <clears throat> in uh, Red Mesa, Utah area. I um, uh, grew up uh, grew up with the Red Mesa Elementary School. I was a Pinto and then a Wildcat for Red Mesa Junior High, and then a, then high school with the Red Mesa High School, and then um, went off to college, got my undergrad in construction management. And then eventually I went back and got my MBA master's of business administration from Arizona state as well. And then currently working on my doctor of education, I'll be actually walking next, next month. So that's kind of pretty cool to think about how my journey that I'll kind of share a little bit with you guys about how um, English was definitely not my preferred language growing up. And I got a nice <coughs> story to share. It's about kind of uh, before this whole, one of the reasons why I decided to go into my doctor of education too was I knew it was going to be intensive writing, which is my, probably my biggest weakness throughout my life was being able to sit down and write a page or two. And now I'm at a hundred pages and I got a, maybe a couple, some more pages to go. So um, again, grew up in Red Mesa, uh, Red Mesa, Utah, and then uh as you can see from my slide to my left is my wife, Jasmine Blackwater Nigren. She's a Shklishni, born for um, uh, Ashinha, and uh, her Chase are Noda Tachitni, and her Nali man is uh, Nali's are Bitatni. So, and that's my wife. She, she's the state representative for District 7 as well, too. And this kind of, this topic actually kind of hit home, too, because um, uh, a lot of people assume, uh, associate me with uh, politics, but one of the things I like to joke about is, well, I've never really been elected. I did run for two months of my life to be a politician, but a lot of people have, uh, since running for vice president of nomination, they've always associated me with being in politics, which is, which is a good thing in my opinion. I know a lot of people tend to think politics is a bad, bad thing or things are, things are not that good in that realm, but in all reality, in my opinion, is that it definitely makes your life a lot easier just knowing um, how things happen. So, again, um, um, so kind of going back to who I am, right? Um, so, talk to you about my school, but definitely the unique story behind me is that I grew up here. Uh, I was raised by my mom, who Pat, uh, my mom who Pat recently passed back in December. And then uh, my grandma, I'm very fortunate to still have my grandma. So my grandma and my mom, I would always <clears throat> switch between both of them. Um, they kind of in instilled in me the language because I know uh, growing up, that was the predominantly spoke language is Navajo. And, uh, and that's kind of where I'm very fortunate to pick up the languages from my mom and my grandma. And they've always constantly spoke to me in that language. And then uh, as I was growing up in elementary school, I was hated going to school. I'd come up with all sorts of excuses to talk to my grandma or my mom and say, hey, I'd love to just stay home and work around the house. And I'm not really too fond of uh, going to school because I'm not that good at it. So I'd always come up with excuses to try to figure out how to stay home and do chores around the house. And, um, and I, one of the um, teachers um, that kind of recently reached back out to me said, said to me kind of a little short story is she goes boo do you remember who I am I was like I, I don't know I ran into I ran into this lady at the um Navajo Nation uh language conference uh last year and she's like you don't know you don't remember me I was like no I don't and so she's like well I I was actually your kindergarten teacher or your kindergarten teacher and I go no I don't remember I thought it was somebody else she goes well you were with somebody else but they they couldn't understand you because it was a Blagana lady. Uh, the Blagana lady didn't really speak Navajo. So I guess for a couple of months, she really tried to speak to me or try to try to figure things out with me, but I just couldn't even respond that well in English. So she put me in her class because she was able to 
be able to speak to me. And I thought to myself, oh, man, that's a crazy story. I didn't even think about that. Because today, I don't really think too much about it, because I think the language that I speak the most is definitely English. And just kind of thinking back on growing up in that situation where uh, you, you're, I'm speaking mainly Navajo at home, and when I go to town, I'll be with my grandma and my mom, and then just thinking about the journey of actually being here today and um, actually going through that doctorate program and it kind of brings the whole thing home about how um, I think all of us, our parents have definitely instilled in us to say, Hey, you know, get your education, um, do your best, uh, figure out how you can uh, come home and help us out. And that's one thing that I've always thought about is just getting that education first. And I think that that's the power of, anything, any, any endeavor, um, any, anything that a leader wants to go about to do is you educate yourself, whether it's through going to college or whatever it may be, or it's watching YouTube or self-educating yourself. It all comes down to educating yourself. And, um, and I think that's a real powerful tool because it's really definitely helped me out because um, there's a lot of things that I, I wouldn't have learned on my own if I didn't educate myself. So, and then for those who, don't really know me. I, I grew up, no running water, no electricity. Um, we, <clears throat> as a family, we always had one ride growing up and it'd either be an auntie or a grandma or somebody who had a vehicle and we'd all pack into it and go to town. And I remember actually sitting in the back of S10, a Chevy, I'm not sure if you guys remember a, a Chevy S10. It's a small little truck and you'd sit behind the seat and kind of be going to town be, hey, I got a front seat instead of sitting in the back of the camper so but eventually you get big so you can't sit back there no more so you got to go go to the back of the camper and uh so that's kind of how I grew up how I grew up and I feel like it's really helped me out uh, have a good perspective and kind of grounded me and um who I am and how I go about my business because even till till uh, today everyone probably knows of family or relatives that are still living in those types of situations. I definitely do. And just to be able to humble yourself and say, hey, you know what, there's still a lot of challenges facing us as people, as Native people, as Navajo people. And let's not forget uh, the mission of trying to get out of that situation. So that's kind of a little bit about me and kind of, I think if some of you are wondering, like, um, did he just go and get all this education and He's like this now. Um, does he know what it's like to struggle? And I definitely do know how. I've definitely been through it. And one of the other stories is I used to sell jewelry too. I think that's kind of what uh, uh, makes me drawn to like organizations like Change Labs or small businesses or trying to empower people. And I feel like growing up uh, as a young individual, young Navajo boy, and and uh, the challenges that. Um, <clears throat> the challenges that um, 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 my uh, uh, being able to help my family was to sell jewelry, go inside of the restaurants. And if you guys are familiar with Farmington or Gallup, there's Earl's, there's Pancake Alley and Chef Bernie's and all those areas. I remember going in there, whatever I could get my hands on, I'd be selling because one of the things I felt good about was being able to provide for my family. And even if I was five or eight or 10, but what that taught me was you care about somebody you care and you, you actually um, try to do something good. And I know that word uh, which sometimes gets thrown around a lot, but it's definitely a, a teaching to say, Hey, you know what, the, let's try to do something for ourselves to try to really make something of us as a, as, as a person or for an individual, whatever it may be. So that's kind of where I really learned how to speak to people because I'd go into restaurants and I'd be like, hey, uh, just the, the, the little key things that kind of make people feel good and, and that sense of eh, and having that um, meaning of family and relatives. And even and early on, I learned how to, I, I learned that you, you're not going to sell everything that you sell when you go inside of a restaurant or jewelry or whatever. That I think that's a, a teaching that all of us learn throughout life is that when you don't win, win everything, but if you can win a few here and there, then that makes your day. So early on, I got used to not selling everything. I'd go in there and sometimes, hey, 
I had grandma, mom, I didn't sell anything. I really tried though, but I really met some cool people. And they said, when they get paid next month, if they see me, they're going to definitely buy something from me. So, <laughs> so that's kind of a little backstory about me when I was growing up as I definitely sold, sold jewelry, went into restaurants and whatever I could do to help out. And then I was actually, when I got a little older, I guess, when I got a little bit more shy, when I got to high school, I didn't really want to be selling stuff. So, <laughs> so I ended up working as a dishwasher as well. So I was a dishwasher at Chef Bernie's in Farmington, did that, did that for a little bit. And even though I lived in Red Mesa, right? Red Mesa is about uh, an hour, hour and 20, 25 minutes, but I definitely find, figure out a way to get to town to at least work for the weekend. And um, also along those lines, I did some work in construction, help, help my uncle out my uncles out or whether it was uh, my stepdad at, at the time to really try to figure out whether it's uh, sheet metal uh, fabricating or building homes in town. I kind of really learned the skill and the art of people that are tradespeople. And that's how I get a lot of respect for people too, that um, actually work out in the fields, they work out in the trenches, they do all the framing and they build things with their hands. And I have a lot of respect for them just because a lot of our people in general prefer to do those types of things because I think that we're very um, unique in our ways that we can think with our minds, think with our hands and build things the way we want to envision it as Navajo people. So I've always been very fond of people and highly respect trade, trade, trade level people. So did that in high school. And then uh, another, uh, another story too is um, when I was in college doing my undergrad, I, um, I, uh, I worked as a uh, security, so I worked for campus uh, event security, so that, that's a story that I rarely tell anybody, but that's kind of where I'd go to the football games, I'd be those event securities or the basketball games, and I'd be giving high fives to basketball players or football players coming off the field, and I'm thinking, man, this little guy's protecting all these six foot plus people, <laughs> so that was kind of a job that I had in college, and then Another job I kind of had was, I think where I'm going with this too, is I know that Change Labs is about uh, entrepreneurship and building your own and figuring out your way. And and I remember in, in college too, I worked for, I got into all sorts of stuff. Like I got into trying to figure out oil, uh, selling oil changes and services. So I, uh, I uh, that's when I, I've never gone door to door in the, in the, co in the city before, but I learned how to go to door to door and try to sell oil changes and try to talk to people and things like that. And I think it comes back down to people that really make things happen. They just try, try things out. You got to have that sense of curiosity and not that sense of, you know, if I go do it, then I'm probably going to fail and it's probably going to hurt me bad. But in my mind, I always thought, well, I didn't know anything about that. If something does happen, at least I learned something from it. So that's kind of, uh, where I learned how to go go to door to door and talk to people and have the door slammed on you and what do you want you're crazy or then there's the other parts where you sell stuff too so that was that was another interesting part and um, but yeah it's uh, it's been a real long interesting journey um, kind of growing up here on the nation going off to college even going off to college was a complete different story too um, it was a it was a story of I graduated high school. I graduated high school and then I was working the summer in construction with my uncle and I was digging out a trench in Farmington, digging out a footer. And I was thinking to myself, do I really want to go to college? I kind of really like this. The reason why I was thinking that too was I was afraid to go to college because at the time, even at 19 years old, uh, the language I spoke prom uh, most of the time was Navajo. The only time I spoke English was either when I was in school. And so I was kind of afraid and shy about going off to Arizona State to where I think at the time was like 90, some crazy percentages, percentages of um, um, uh, non-native non people. And so so eventually I, I told myself, I was like, you know, let me just give it a shot. So I got home and talked to my grandma and my mom and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to I'm actually going to go try that college thing. Uh, so I 
so I, um, so I took off, I took off in my car that, um, I kind of worked for and my mom helped me get my first vehicle as well. And, and just trying to never really, even towards Western Navajo, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really know what it looked like because I never really went out that way. And even I never really realized how big the nation was. And I ended up driving through flag, stopped in Anthem. When I stopped in Anthem, I had no idea where to go. The only thing I had about ASU was a little pamphlet that I got in the mail that showed Manzanita. There was a dorm that where I was going to stay. And at the time, you could say I was being all somehow where I was like, hey, I'm trying to look, I'm looking for this building right here. This one right here, I'm going to go to college right here. And this is where I'm going to live. Do you know where this building is? It's in Tempe, Arizona. And then uh, I remember the gas station attendant was like, well, um, I can't show you, but there's a map. <clears throat> so I ended up buying a map. I bought a map and the lady, gave the it was a man. Yeah, he gave me a. He gave me that map and he kind of circled uh, ASU and ASU. He didn't, he didn't say where Manzanita was. He just circled where ASU was in Tempe. And I was in North Phoenix and Anthem. And um, so then I was, I had the map out. I was like, hey, good thing I know how to read a map. So I was like, well, I gotta go this way, go this way, go, this way, go that way. And I'll probably get there. So by the time I got there, I could, you, you could see, I could see the buildings. Okay, that's the that's the building that probably matches. Let me go in there and see what they tell me. So I went in and they said, well, uh, okay, yeah, you are signed up to be living here. And then uh, after that, it was just kind of going out uh, in, and, in and out of trying to get settled in college and trying to find my way because I didn't have any relatives or anybody that kind of went down there to go with me or, or to not hold my hand, but to, to guide me. Um, I think that's a, a journey that a lot of us do take, and I think it's a journey that we definitely need to tell our people is, uh, you know, try it out, have a good attitude, and have a good attitude, and have a positive mindset about who you are and the things that you're doing, because I feel in Navajo, it's a you know what I mean, whether it means being able to communicate with people that are not even Navajo. You treat them like they're your uncles or your dads or your your moms or your relatives. And and that's kind of how I feel like I was very fortunate to go down to Phoenix and I didn't have an issue adapting because I was able to just speak to people as if I was back home and tried to, and a lot of them helped me get through areas. They got me through the dorm. They got me to sign up for classes and all sorts of stuff. So so that was my first experience because when man, when I went, when I got down to ASC, I was like, oh, I don't know. I see, I, I was just like, I only see these kind of people on TV. I'm used to hanging out with uh, so I was thinking to myself, I was like, man, when I, I've only seen these people on TV, now I get to hang out with these people in real life. That's kind of cool. That's what I was thinking. And um, but yeah, that was kind of my journey to go to college and then um and then kind of, then I was always, always told, you know, learn, learn the skills, skill sets of what it's like to work off the nation. And so after graduating college, I ended up working for a construction company. It was a billion dollar construction company. They worked all over, all over the nation. Um, so while I was there, I learned the skill sets of being a project manager. And then eventually um, CEO and the leadership team was like, uh, hey, how would you, uh, would you be interested in kind of traveling for us and trying to visit other offices and figure out how, what you think about, because I feel like it comes back to, yeah, right, our, our way of teaching. So, and they said, well, you, you do a good job working with people. People like to work with you. People like to talk with you. You have that sense of, uh, you know what I mean, in Navajo, it's like you're very open and you're someone good to be around and so I took on that challenge and then eventually I was able to, I went from uh, never being on a plane to being on a plane almost every week. So I did that for about four years and I got to see a, a lot of part of the, of the nation. And, uh, and I think at one point in time, I don't know how many hundreds of flights I've been on, but before then I never really flew until then. But that also taught me to kind of really see what it's like to live in Sarasota, Florida, or Orlando, or Miami, or, or the Chicago area, or the Texas area, or the Reno, Las Vegas area. So you kind of, I got to know what it's like to live way out there. And then when I was actually doing a lot of this traveling, too, I 
kind of became a minimalist. Uh, I, 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 I'm always like, it comes back to educating, right? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't learn these things in, um, in college or whatever, but I learned to min, uh, have only the things that I really need. So for about two to three years, um, I lived out of a suitcase. Uh, so the only thing I had was a suitcase and every, so everything, so everything that I had in Phoenix, I got rid of it, sold it, yard sale, whatever it may be. And I downsized a suitcase. And at that time, uh, my wife was still in school at Stanford as well too. So it made things so much easier to fly, to be in Florida, to go fly back, to be with her or whatever it may be. And it was just so much easier to mobilize because one of the things you, what I learned from that experience was there's only a certain amount of things that you really truly need. And then there's other times when you're carrying too much stuff that you shouldn't be carrying. And, and that was a really good experience to where <laughs> living out of a suitcase. Sometimes I think about it now, now I, I do. Now, now I go visit, uh, visit my wife down in Phoenix cause she's in, she's in session. And I'm thinking, man, I can't even pack a, a suitcase. Remember we used to live, go months when, out of one suitcase. What happened? Yada, yada. And um, so that was kind of an inter interesting story, uh, working for a big company and uh, learning how to, what it's like to be competitive outside of the nation. And then uh, the opportunity of um, running for vice president of the Navajo Nation came up. And at that time, prior, prior to the opportunity that came up to be vice president, right? One of the things I've always been passionate about uh, kind of surrounding this topic today of tomorrow's native leaders is our government, our mother government here on the Navajo Nation. And I've always had that interest and keen of and so I've always tried to stay tuned with what was going on on the nation and not necessarily like um, I know a lot a lot of the things that um, that I've done in my, in, with me was trying to educate myself on why are these people not on you what 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 do, how do they go about their business? How are they envisioning the things that they need to do for our communities? So I've always had that tie to learn about the Navajo Nation politics and government. And then, um, so when that opportunity came up, I felt like I was ready because I've done some homework. I kind of knew what, what it was like to be, uh, how the government operated, and then to be given that opportunity to be the youngest person to ever run for vice president. At the time, I was 30, just turned 31 years old. So 31 years old and running for vice president of Navajo Nation. And again, this is the story of, I think a lot of us also share too, is a lot of us like uh, before running for vice president, I left high school and then it was about uh, 12, 12 or 13 years before I, I was actually here for a solid two months campaigning. Because a lot of us go off and get an education, get a job and come home every week or every other month to visit family and friends. And that was kind of my story. And to be really thrown into visiting all sorts of communities across the Navajo Nation really opened my eyes a lot because you could see the same struggles that I seen 12 years ago being a being a kid in high school to now being an adult and saying, man, meaning like, why haven't we progressed forward? What's what's holding us back? And, and just seeing that firsthand really reopened my eyes about how, um, and then as, as I would visit communities too, right? Again, being 31 years old, running for vice president, and then you visit communities, chapters, all these other places, and 98% of the time, all the events that I went to, I was the youngest person in the room by maybe five, 10, 10 years. And I, and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, man, where's all, where's all my people, people my age, how do I stay on so on this case, I would think to myself, I'm like, okay, um, so how, how, so that's when my focus returned to how, how do we get people my age more involved and more interested and in, to really try to help our nation move forward in the direction that it really needs to move. And so I started thinking about some of those things. And then as, as I started to really think about it, I thought to myself, because you go and visit families all the way across the nation, and you only notice it's the grandmas, the grandpas, the uncles, and the people that really haven't gone off and gotten an education. They're the ones that are here holding on to our lands. And I really respect those people because it takes a lot to live on the nation. 
And for them to stay here and hold on to the land of the 27,000 square miles is, is very honorary because a lot of people can't do that. And I think about how, for my example, right? 12 years off the nation, I have a job and I was working out in Phoenix. And then, and then I'm thinking to myself, man, all, all the people that really were encouraged to really make a difference for our nation and come home and help, help us out. They're out making a career. They're doing something with themselves. So the only people left here on the nation are the ones that are supporting the people that are off the nation because they're but there's really never been a mechanism to try to figure out how do we bring our, our highly skilled, educated people back. And that was one of the things that I noticed uh, during the 2018 election was, man, I'm like, imagine how much better we would be if we bring back our most talented people back on, on the nation to put them to work to help us address some of these issues. So that's one thing that I noticed in the 2018 election. And um, that's where I was labeled politician, <laughs> even though in my story, right, I've always been working kind of entrepreneur or trying to figure out how to sell stuff and try to make things happen and work off the nation and do these things. And, and I was thinking back to myself, I was like, man, like how, how late, Ola, how can we solve that, that problem? That's one of the things I was thinking about, but and then I also thought to myself, I'm like, well, am I the only one that's really interested in what's going on with our nation, our government, our people, and things like that? Is it, is it just not, not, not that exciting anymore, or what's going on? But then you talk to other people as well too. There's well, when I go home, nobody really wants to talk to me. They, I'm overqualified. Um, there's all these barriers that also that our people face too that we kind of put upon ourselves, and. And then another thing I, I really experienced during the 2018 election was uh, I never thought I'd be subject to racism, right? <laughs> so I, that was the first time uh, that I was ever, that, that didn't happen in Phoenix, that didn't happen anywhere across the nation. But the first time I was subject to racism was actually here on the Navajo Nation when I ran for vice president of the Navajo Nation. I, people have flat out told me, you're not Navajo, you're not this, you're not that, what are you doing? I'm, this guy's got a funny name. What's what's his business, right? And I actually had some elderly people call me out and say all sorts of crazy stuff to me in my face. And at the time, the first time I was faced with that, I think that's where political one on one, right? Have thick skin and only taking at least a, a third of what people are negatively that they're saying about you. But I took it to heart because this was an elderly person, and he definitely said a lot of crazy stuff to me, and it kind of broke my heart because I was like, man, I'm like that's not, that's not what I'm all about. I'm like, sure. I might be half Vietnamese or sure. My, my name might be different, but I grew up, I speak Navajo and this is all I ever know. And I don't even know one single word of Vietnamese. That's what I was thinking. I've never even met my family on the Vietnamese side. And, um, and I think that's the, one of the issues too, is that we're so, um, sometimes we're, we're uh, we, we hold ourselves down a little bit as a nation to really try to figure out you know I mean? how can we work collectively together to try to move our nation forward as one and i think that um and i think that's what's sometimes missing but i didn't let that get get the best of me because that just kind of reminded me of like some of the struggles right because at first i used to hear people say like well i'm highly educated um i, I go i try to apply for a job and nobody wants to hire me and things like that then my issue too was, well, he's not Navajo enough. Go that, so that was kind of my first hurdle going into the political session uh, section, was that uh, I wasn't Navajo enough, and I was like, what about my hair bun? My hair bun not good enough. <laughs> so, but and I think that's one thing too is Navajo people we really that's one of our traits, right? To get through our days, to get through our struggles is uh, uh, we laugh a lot. You know what I mean? Cause there's, uh, there's certain things that we do within ourselves to try to make us feel good. And you go to a family gathering or wherever you go, people are always laughing and making jokes and whatever it may be. And, um, that's kind of, well, I kind of took it out of that situation was, okay, well, it's a good challenge that people think I'm not Navajo. <laughs> that's real new to me. <laughs> and I was thinking that, but so, so then what I ended up doing is I did um, do the whole, um, do the whole uh, 
uh, situation was I really tried to um, um, tried to uh, speak Navajo in all of our all of our campaigns, and so I, I challenged myself because I, I never really spoke Navajo since I was in high school. But when I came back, and then with the election happened, my perception was um, Navajo people want to hear you speak Navajo, and these guys are saying these things to me and that I'm not Navajo and whatnot. So I changed my mindset and all my speeches were in Navajo. That's kind of what we did. And during the campaign was I challenged myself to really just speak Navajo. And then towards the end of the campaign, people said, oh, he's too Navajo. He, he, never, he never speaks English. Does he know how to speak English? <laughs> so, and that's, like I said, I was all new to me. You just take a little bit of what people say to you, a little bit of that criticism and kind of reflect back on what, what, what some of the things that they're saying. And uh, that was my experience with the campaign. And then um, again, and then working off, working back. So the campaign ended. Um, I went, I was that following week or that week, I was on a flight back to Florida. So I was actually in Miami, Florida, Miami, Florida. I woke up that next day and I was back to my regular job and I'm what for my run in the morning, right next to the Atlantic Ocean. I touch the water and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Yada, Allah, just a couple of days ago, you're away out in the boonies of grandma, grandpa, and how are you going to help them out? Now you're over here right next to the beach and uh, like there's no issues back home and you're just back to your normal job. And so since that morning, I thought to myself, I'm like, well, I got to figure out how to try to get home and try to figure out how to how to help out and try to make that commitment. Because I remember I, th I thinking back, I was like, man, I, I don't see a lot of people in my, like myself back home trying to make a difference. And it's real hard. And it is really hard because you gotta, you kind of almost have to be really lucky. I, I kind of find myself very fortunate to be actually be back home right now working for a tribal enterprise, right? Um, so I work for Navajo Engineering Construction Authority. I'm the chief commercial officer. I, I do a lot of strategies on marketing, sales, government relationships and developments to try to figure out how can we take NECA to the next level? How can we work with small businesses? How do we grow collectively as an organization? So that's kind of my role at NECA. And, but before coming to NECA, I was out in uh, Florida and the opportunity at NECA came up and I said, why not? Let's go try it. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, man, okay, well, let's just try it out and give it a shot. And my wife and I, we talked about it. At the time, my wife was in law school, and some of the things that we do, my wife and I, is we try to, uh, we do the things that are kind of like for the the greater good, because um, uh, we're both big into trying to help our communities, help our people. So the bigger purpose was how do this is an opportunity for us to go home. You can go home first, and then I'll finish law school. I'll come back, and then we'll really tackle things together. And so I came home and it was my, I went from an organization that was 90, uh, predominantly non, non, um, to 99.9% .9 Navajo. <laughs> so it was a complete change in, change in mindset as well, too, because um, I got used to working outside of the nation and some of those things don't work, do work. And I tried to come back and tried to implement some of those things. And then I quickly learned that you got to, take things a little slow, take, take things and talk about it. You know, it's not slower. I know a lot of people, sometimes they call it slow, but it's really, I think it's a Navajo thing is like, you got to sit down and really talk about it collectively, get the, get the whole uh, community involved to get their opinions on it. Cause I remember when I first came back, I really tried to push a lot of the initiatives uh, since coming back from NECA, we've definitely changed a lot of um, different ways of doing business, different ways of perceptions of Navajo Engineering Construction Authority, and we've gone into a lot of new markets and sectors. We started a new business unit, and so we've done a lot of cool stuff at NECA, and, um, and uh, for those of you that don't really know NECA, NECA is definitely uh, the largest construction company in the Four Corners area. We employ sometimes close to 500 people. We've given like close to 19 million in scholarships back to the Navajo Nation. And um, we're the, the whole sole focus of NECA is to try to train and develop Navajo people and trades people. So that's kind of the organization. And I felt like it was a good place to be because it's like I got, I worked for a different organization that was, um, you tried to, you, I, I kind of knew where the, the dollars were going. The dollars are going towards scholarships. So that's kind of what excites me every time someone tries to say, well, why are you promoting NECA? I'm like, well, when we make money, uh, it goes back into scholarships. 
So that's kind of my, my focus at NECA. And so being back home now, as of this past Monday, I've been at NECA for two years. So I've been at NECA for two years. And even this past year, we did some really cool things. Like uh, we were able to, um, I got to, I got to go and visit some homes and we built bathroom additions, water lines, septic tanks, cisterns. And throughout the whole Navajo Nation, I was actually uh, at the forefront of that, working and visiting people and visiting their homes, doing assessments. So we served over 100 and I think 30 or 40 people. And going to people's homes really reopened my eyes too and seeing that how much our people are still struggling. Our people are really struggling at this moment in time some of them don't even have bathroom additions and that really made me cry over this past year too was when you visit a family and you see how they're living and they're all alone all by themselves and they're really trying to make things happen um, so it's very rewarding rewarding this past year to really help a lot of families so I know some of you that follow me on social media I, I don't talk too much about my day-to-day -day stuff but that's kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day is try to figure out how do we really use the commercial power of NECA to try to help our people, whether it's water lines, bathroom additions, or, or highway construction, the things that you really need as a nation to be strong and try to per, try to really promote that and work with leadership as well. And I got to um, <clears throat> experience some of those things. So that's kind of in brief. I know this is the introduction. Um, here, when I was putting this slide together, I was thinking to myself, man, 90 minutes. I don't know if I can do 90 minutes. And here I'm barely on the Barely the third slide, and I got 39 minutes left. So I'm going to go to the next slide now. So, again, that's kind of a little brief background about me, who I am, and trying to just uh, give you an idea of me as a person. And that I'm very, um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm very, you could say I was a really shy person. I'm naturally really shy and naturally really tried to, don't really try to put myself out there, but I think. Maybe that's why a lot of people that know me is because I try not to put myself <laughs> put myself out there too much. So, um, but yeah, so that's kind of kind of me in a nutshell. And then, um, so yeah, so the next thing I kind of kind of going back to the agenda too, I kind of want to talk about the history of Navajo Nation leadership and government and whatnot. So, so I'm gonna dive into that a little bit about some of the things that I, I was thinking about when I was thinking about. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about how can we, um, as people listening in, to really kind of understand the history of Navajo. Excuse me. I had uh, potatoes, bacon, and spam this morning, so excuse me. And um, so, again, um, so this is the history of some Navajo leadership. So to your very uh, left over here is uh, Chi Dodge, the first tribal chairman. Uh, so he was actually appointed by... Um, appointed by the BIA director to be the chairman of the chairman of the tribe back in the day. And that's when they tried to do a lot of the, um, uh, the oil leases and try to figure out how can we, the government was trying to figure out how can we actually work with the nation to make things happen. And so they appointed Chi Dodge. And then after him, a couple of the leaders were appointed to be the chairman. And then, uh, so J what, one of the reasons why I put Jacob Morgan here is also because he was actually the first person to get elected Right, by the people. So he, this was your first elected uh, official and it was in the 1950s. So he was actually the first one to actually get elected by the people. And then you got Raymond Nake, who was a two-term uh, chairman as well. And that's kind of his legacy there, so probably the uh, two-term chairman there as well. And then you got Peter McDonald too, uh, who was a three-term and three-and-a-half term chairman. And just kind of just looking through the, the through this top group, right? You kind of see, um, you get your guy that was appointed by the BIA, the first elected leadership that was very stable and worked with the people. And then you get Peter McDonald, where he challenged because he kind of has a really interesting story when you read about him is how he really challenged the, the status quo and tried to figure out how do we bring our nation to the forefront, you know, the vision of why can't we, why can't we do it as a people? You know, why can't we be powerful? Why can't we have influence? Why can't we be the front runners of these things and things like that? And I feel like, and I remember NECA was actually started under him. There's a lot of tribal enterprises that were started under the Peter McDonald era, the shopping centers and a lot of the developments that did happen over throughout the years was definitely uh, 
championed by Mr. McDonald, Chairman McDonald. And he's one of those leaders that really very artistic when you listen to him, whether he, he's speaking English or speaking Navajo, very artistic. And even to this day, as the president of the Navajo Code Talk Association, it's always interesting to hear, hear your leaders about where they've come from, where they've journeyed, and how they've gone about their business. So, And so that's Peter McDonald. And then you got um, President, Chairman and President Za over here. So he's the, the last, uh, the, uh, he was a chairman of the Navajo Nation as well, and the first elected president of the Navajo Nation after the 1998 uh, disassociation of the chairmanship and went to three branch type of government. So, and then uh, Mr. Zal is also really uh, known for the permanent trust fund where he put put dollars aside with some of his uh, team members to say, hey, you know what, the Nostal Hadis have been the Mr. Lace, let's put this investment in. And I believe that investment now is probably four to five billion that we use every year to try to fund certain programs. So, he definitely championed. So when when you think about these types of leaders, it comes back to, I was trying to find some older pictures because I've seen uh, younger photos of them. You see them really sharp in suits and whatnot. And I was trying to find some of those photos to show you guys because a lot of these people came home kind of like what we all do is we try to see how can we be a champion to do something within our community? And maybe we're not chairmanship or maybe we're not presidents, but what can we do to champion things on our own. And that's what these people did is they had vision. What can we do today that will build a strong foundation for our gen generations to come? And uh, and then the next one is the late Albert Hale as well too. He was the president of the Navajo Nation. Very young, I think he's the only ever attorney to be president of the Navajo Nation. And uh, his, he's really well known for trying to bring power back to the local communities. Uh, try, how do we empower our local communities and how we, how do we, meaning like, let's try to take some power from Winter Rock and give it to the individual, individual government entities back home and the chapters and the local communities so they can actually work quicker and faster. And that's kind of one, one of his legacies. And then, uh, <clears throat> so, so, and then you get uh, Mr. Shirley over here. He's really well known for the, council reduction and some of the water line um, um, litigation, like the San Juan River, the water rights, and obviously the the referendums to reduce the council and give the president line item veto because because uh, you go from Mr. Uh, McDonald over here, he kind of had like the ultimate authority, right? He kind of ruled with an iron fist and this is the direction, this is the way we're gonna do it. And whatever is, is the red tape, we're gonna remove it and we're gonna move forward. And then uh, when we switched to the presidency, a lot of that authority was taken from the presidency, presidency in the executive branch. So there wasn't really the iron fists. And there was a lot of things that kind of figured, figured out how to, how to work together. So I, I believe that his president line and item veto was trying to, the intention was to try to bring some balance back to the uh, three branch system. And so that's kind of, again, uh, Mr. Shirley is also the last two term president as well too. So. And that's one of the things that you'll definitely notice too throughout the history of the Navajo Nation is, so you go from, uh, um, um, I think that's one of the things that is real difficult on Navajo is we're really, we're really, we, we keep our leaderships, leadership accountable. Uh, I think that you can kind of see that because you get Raymond Ake back in the 60s, was a two-term president. You get McDonald back in the 70s and 80s, who's back-to-back president. And then you get Mr. Shirley, who was in the 2000s. So between President uh, Chairman McDonald and Joe Shirley, there was a 30 year period of every four years, there's a new president, new president, new president. And then since uh, Mr. Shirley too, it's always been new president, new president, new president. So I think our Navajo people are very, they try to, they're real in tune to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and how do you build a strong nation? So that's kind of a little history, uh, history on past leaders. And then um, kind of some historical events that I um, gathered from the Navajo Government uh, Development Office, and they kind of provided me with some of this information as well, too. So, um, so Welde, 1864, the Treaty of 1868, and then in 1920, 1925, Navajo Nation Council was established. In 1930s, they were trying to figure out how, how do we assimilate and work as a government. Uh, 1940s to the 60s, Navajo Bill of Rights and constitutional attempts. 
because at this very moment in time, there there isn't a constitution that's been then that has been blessed by the Navajo people. It's more than just kind of uh, here and there that uh, they, they've been made changes. So the people haven't actually really voted and had a say in this is how we want to be governed. It's always just been um, either the BIA dictated it or there's just certain things adopted throughout throughout the years. But even till the to, to today, there's really no, con the Navajo Nation doesn't have a constitution. So, and then the 1990s and 80s, when the whole uh, chairmanship, the presidency happened, they made some changes to, to the laws. And then you had Navajo fundamental law and the LGA initiatives. And then the 2000s, right? When they had the 88 to the uh, president line in Ayavita. So this was actually the first time in Navajo history that the Navajo people had a say in how they want to be governed. So I think that uh, that's a very good thing to think about is I know that there's comments on both sides on whether 88, 24 was too little or 44, 48 should have been better or 88 should have been good. But but in, during that time, that was the only time that the Navajo people actually had a real say in how they want to be governed. So I think this is kind of a little bit of history about Navajo governmental events. And then this next one, I kind of, I think some of you are already familiar with the legislative branch. So this is Speaker Damon over here and this is the Navajo Nation Council Chambers. So this is the 24th Navajo Nation Council. And then uh, you got the executive branch. This is the entrance of the president's office. So, and then to, over here in this photo, you got President Nez, Vice President Lizer over here in the Washington office and their staff, they have a chief of staff, they got executive staff and they oversee all the divisions and programs. And then you got um, the judicial branch. You got the Navajo Nation Supreme Court, Chief Justice Joanne Jane right here. And I think Justice Shirley right here. And, um, and then you got the Navajo Nation chapters and governments. There's 110 all the way across the Navajo Nation. And then it's all broken up by agencies. You got your Northern, Western, uh, Central, Fort Defiance, and Eastern agencies. So that's kind of how the government is broken down. And so that's a little bit about uh, government. I think that everybody that wants to work on Navajo, wants to work on how to work with leadership, definitely needs to have a little a foundation of how government works on, on the nation or whatever tribes that you're working with, because it's very important because what moves and shakes things on, on the Navajo nation or any tribe is the tribe itself, the tribal government, because even the tribe themselves are trying to, um, um, uh, show to the world that they are sovereign nations and that they can do things and the more and more that we can support government and have them be more established themselves actually trickles down to the ordinary people like myself and everybody else listening on on, on the zoom meeting um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a little brief um, about uh, government and then uh, I kind of uh, wanted to talk a little bit about today's challenges here on the Navajo Nation too is um, you kind of look at these photos over here to the right. So you get this photo over here. So this is a, so this is an actual photo actually taken, uh, taken by me. The, both of these photos are taken by me. This one's in, um, in uh, um, Eastern Navajo. This one's in Western Navajo. So this is a, a photo that's only a few months old. So you can kind of just see like the challenges that we still face today because you got grandma over here that still hauls water lives in here wood fire stove and and she's living in, in these types of conditions to try to make things happen so when we talk about uh, issues of poverty and all these things that are still affecting the nation it's still uh, true today uh, true today and it's still affecting a lot of people and then you got grandpa over here who both, uh, he's got a, he still haul, hauls water over here, lives in this little hogan. This is the kids, like a living room area over here and the sheep corral is way in the back. But we still have issues to access to water and then broadband, electricity, housing, retail, meaning like there's really no places for us to enjoy the things that we wanna enjoy, the reason why we go to town and things like that and services, there's really no, can't go get your hair cut somewhere you can't go get um uh food you can order to show up at your doorsteps or even a gym or things like that that a lot of us take for granted and then uh, back home people really just even need the basic necessities of of things that need to be as well too so i think and i think as today's leaders tomorrow's leaders we got to always think about fundamentally how <clears throat> 
how we can help out. You know, at the end of the day, it's always about um, we're all Navajo people. You know, that's that's one of the things that I'm very very passionate about is. Uh, I, I, I really, me personally, I try to never bring religion or anything that might divide a people or things like that is because end of the day, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we've been put on as uh, uh, holy people, you know, people to say, you know, this is who we are as Navajo people. And uh, whether you're half Vietnamese like myself, full Navajo or quarter, whatever it may be, you got some Navajo and you, you're Dene, you know, that's what really brings us all together. And we all have one one mission that we need to align ourselves is how do we bring our nation to be prosperous and to be able to not see these things today in 2021, you know what I mean? These are, these are real photos here until 2021. And if we can really collectively put our minds together and figure out how can we avoid things like this. And I think that's one of the nice missions about change labs is trying to empower our people, empower them to build websites, empower them to have business plans, empower them to be, um, make something of themselves so they can help with the uh, other services, retail, maybe even housing. How do you how do you collectively make a nation stronger? You make a nation stronger by reducing poverty, right? You reduce poverty by by people having jobs on the nation, by employing people and things like that. And then the next point is mental health issues, right? We still have a lot of challenges with mental health issues. There's issues with suicide, there's issues with addiction, drug abuse, alcoholism, you see it across the nation. And then again, like I said, too, a lot of the people that are here are the ones that really just hold on to um, uh, hold on to our, our homelands, because everyone on this phone probably knows the relatives that just stay home and they're holding on to the land. And they're also the biggest cheerleaders too. You know what I mean? Like um, you, you might have people with alcoholism or drug or mental health issues, but they're your, they're, if you're, uh, they're probably your biggest cheerleaders as well too. If you, like myself, you've gone off to college, you got all this stuff and they're the ones that are always saying, I'm praying for you every day. I pray for you. And I, and I, <clears throat> and I, and I feel bad because they do a lot of praying and they think about us as, as people, but in return, we tried, we haven't really helped those types of people. And I think uh, down the road, when we kind of come together and really provide the resources that they need, that we can really tackle some of these issues that our nation is still feeling those impacts today. Because because anytime I meet people like that, I, I, I tell them straight up, you know, you're a very important person. You're a very important person. You might not have a vehicle you might not have nice a nice house you might not have all these things but you know what because of you we enjoy the Navajo Nation because of you staying on the Navajo Nation we have such a large land base that we can still say that we're holding on to our land and I myself can come home and say like this is our land and um, and I think this innovative solutions to try to collaborate and figure out how do we reduce the poverty level how do we reduce the unemployment levels on the Navajo Nation. How do how do we give people more jobs? How can we think about those things and trying to just move as one to move into the next level? Because I really truly believe that our people are really capable of doing amazing things, and it's just um, it's just been a long time since we've really um, come back together because we've all been in a state of. We need to be educated. We need to learn things off the nation. We need to do all these sorts of things. But we've, we've, I think some of us have really prepared ourselves. And but now we're we're trying to figure out how do we actually come back and give back with open arms. And I think that all comes back down to working with leadership, working with leadership or elected officials, and trying to figure out this is this is um, this is what I want to help you guys with. This is what I'm passionate about. This is how how we make things happen. And then in general, there's just such a lack of opportunities for ordinary people, right? Regular people, everyday people, opportunities are just not there for them. Uh, some of them don't have access to Zoom phone calls, or some of them haven't even been taught how to how to use Zoom or a computer or things like that. And some of them, um, I know Change Labs is very fortunate to be there for some of the people in Western now, but some of them don't even know how to start businesses to be successful and how to really set themselves up for a better future for them themselves and their families. So I think that's in you know, overall, that's kind of some of the challenges that I can think of. I know there's probably some more challenges, but 
as you're listening today, I know that as Native leaders, I really truly believe the ones on the phone call really do care. And I think um, eventually we're going to get there. We're definitely going to get there. And, um, and then this next slide is about how do we prepare for tomorrow? How do, preparing tomorrow's Native leaders, right? Which is me, you, everybody else on this phone call is how do we get ourselves prepared? And some of the things that I've learned on how I've prepared a little bit, and I'm still preparing, right? One of the stories I always like to tell is, hey, you never know someone, somebody's going to knock on your door, opportunities to knock on your door. Tick, tick, tick. Hey, yate, hey, di nanishadi li hasmin binga. You know what I mean? Are you, opportunity knocks at your door and they open it and they present the opportunity. If you're not prepared for it, then opportunity kind of walks past you. And the mindset that I even, tell some of my relatives and some of my friends that are really some of them don't have jobs some of them are struggling a lot of those people are in those situations I always tell them uh, try to give them hope right I always say you, you never know tomorrow you might get that phone call but you have to do the work yourself too is you got to prepare yourself you got to prepare yourself even if you're visually just imagining things of developing new skills new skills you're you're watching YouTube videos, you're learning things, you're reading, reading up on things because you just never know when opportunity will not. But the best thing you can do is be prepared. So with that being said, it's getting involved. I remember in college, I got involved in the council reduction. So that's kind of how I, um, that was the very first time I ever really been involved with um, the Navajo Nation government was as a college student, I was given the opportunity uh, to say, hey, do you want to have a voice and trying to bring more accountability to the Navajo Nation government, we really need to reduce the government, the, the delegates, and give more authority to the president, and try to, the intention, right, um, was to try to make things happen quicker, so by the, the concept was reducing the council so you can actually make things happen a lot quicker and more effectively, and so back in college, I definitely, undergrad, I helped out with that, so getting involved, right, getting involved, and and then even after college, just uh, showing up at forums, talking to leaders. And I think that's one of the best things that you can do right now is call your council delegate because you know, I know that sometimes it might be tough to get to a more high profile person. But I'll guarantee you, your council delegate, you can definitely reach your council delegate anytime and have a cup of coffee or a phone call with them and just pick their brains because they're there for a reason. Um, I know that some of them are always asking to get opinions from professional people and to expand their own networks as well too. So if you're thinking about it, look up who your council delegate is and just set up, get coffee going, get a Zoom call going with them and just ask them questions and figure out how can I help you be successful. And I think that's one thing that we, as people, we never say to you as well too, is like, how can I make you better? I wanna be able to make you better. If you're willing to say that, if you're willing to express that to somebody, I want to be able to help you. You know what I mean? In return, somehow you get blessed. You get blessed because I remember my mom, my grandma, they used to say, you know what I mean? If you're willing to give in return, you're going to get something back. Um, so, so that's kind of what I advise everybody on the phone is call your delegate, call your local leaders, your chapter officials and your chapter managers, whatnot, and just ask them, Hey, I like to volunteer an hour a week out of, out of my day, out of my week and try to figure out how can I help you be successful? And you might not get anything in return, but what you'll learn is that you're going to learn the issues. You're going to learn about some of the challenges and some of the things that might actually help your communities. So I think that's a, a challenge that I don't want to tell all of you is call your delegate, call your chapter officials and figure out how you can help them because they're probably not used to that, right? Because usually as a, a chapter official or whatnot, it's usually, how can you help me? You know, how can you help me? But as leaders, you got to turn, turn it back around and say, how can I help you out? Let me help you out, Mr. Council Delegate, Mr. Chapter Vice President, President Secretary, let me help you out. I know there's a lot of things that you're facing and as an expert, as a, because everybody in their own, own is good at something you know what i mean you might have not never gone to college you might have only gone to eighth grade or whatever it may be is you're good at something you're good at something and that's why you're here today too is you're good at something and the people that really need help and guide it sometimes need need that skill set for them to help to help the community at large so i challenge you on that and then <clears throat> and then learn learn the issues affecting your home communities too 
is learn, just look around and be like, what, what's going on here? What's holding us back? And have those discussions when you talk with leaders and try to figure out what can you do? Can you draft legislation? Can you draft policies to really think things through and try to help our help ourselves become more efficient and effective in the future? And then, um, like I said, you got to work with people. You have your so when you start doing this and you start challenging yourself to be in those shoes and then you start developing things on your own, right? You just start developing things on your own and you start developing your own vision of how things should be. So then you, that's that next step. And then the other step is you start working with people that are, have the same visionary types of concepts. And then you come together and you try to figure out how can you collectively work together. So not meaning the work will be lighter together. So that's kind of some advice from me to you is to get involved and really um, be uh, um, engaging in some of your local leaders because you'll be really surprised on some of the information that you can get off some of your local leaders, things that you've always thought about. Again, um, you're a simple phone call away and you, you're you going to really start piecing things together because end of the day, what makes us strong as Native people, as a strong nation, is how when we start doing things ourselves, that's going to be a scary situation for the rest of the country, right? Imagine if the Navajo Nation themselves were more, just as powerful or more powerful than a lot of states, you know what I mean? If we didn't have to say, you know, government, you know, government, you keep your money, you know what I mean? Well, we might take some things here and there, but at the end of the day, we want to do things ourselves, you know, we we have every wherewithal to do the things that we can do to make a, to actually be really sovereign. You know what I mean? To to have that pride instilled in us to say, hey, kiss. We've been here for thousands of years, and we're gonna accelerate during these times, just to just to have that mindset into the future of really. And it starts with everybody on this phone call too. It's just really. Um, having that mindset of we're capable, we are more than capable of doing the things that outside people are doing and even better. You know what I mean? It's like um, one of the examples I like to give is because of our language and our culture and our way of life, we enjoy 27,000 square miles of land, right? Um, a lot of those grandmas, grandpas in the 19, 1980s and 1800s, didn't have an education, barely spoke any English, you know what I mean? But you know what they did? They secured a large land base, 27,000 square miles bigger than 12 or 13 states, you know what I mean? And they didn't even have an education. If our ancestors can do something great like that, I think we can do something even just as good or even better to really bring ourselves as a nation into being really uh, to that next level, because you think about that, right? You think, man, how did grandma and grandpa and all those people secure 27,000 square miles in the middle of the, the, the most powerful country in the world? We own 27, we, we occupy 27,000 square miles and we do what we want with it most of the time and we're given the opportunity to do something. Why not have a little uh, superpower in the middle of, of the United States too as well to and that could be us, the Navajo Nation, the Navajo people as well, too. So that's kind of a, a thing that I truly believe that we can get to that level. I can get to that level to where the president of the United States or governors or wherever, they pick up the phone call and say, hey, Navajo Nation, can you help us out? We really need uh, people that have a technology background. We really need skilled labor. We really need these things out on the East Coast, can you supply us with this? You know what I mean? Then then we're really sovereign. We're really a nation within a nation is when we can say, um, it, it would be, it'll be a really good day, right? It's gonna be a really good day when we actually send resources outside of the nation to help the rest of the country. And, um, and I think we can get to that level because I think that the more and more as a people we're learning we're figuring things out. We were in the age of educating ourselves, getting educated. And I think the other thing, last kind of a last comment is too, is to really just figure out, because um, I know, like I said, I'm very fortunate. I speak Navajo fluently. And there's times when I don't speak Navajo, uh, but I really challenge leaders to really just learn the language as much as they can. Well, there's a lot of fluent Navajo speakers still with us to to this day 
is to sit down with um, elders and say, hey, maybe grandma and grandpa, let me buy you a cup of coffee and we get you some food and have breakfast and have lunch. Let me come over and I want you to just, just talk to me in Navajo. You know what I mean? I think a lot of elders that, that are still here with us today, they understand a little bit of English. So that's, that's an opportunity for you to say, hey, grandpa, how do you say this? Grandma, how do you say that? How would you express this? And then always with today's technology, right? Record, record those things, record those discussions so you can go revisit those conversations later because they're going to be really valuable. And uh, I, I, I believe that if we can really sustain our language into the next century and the centuries after, then we're going to be a, an even stronger nation, right? Because it's, uh, I know that we can do it, it can be done, and we just got to really put our efforts into it as well, too, because as Navajo people, we really are fortunate to have so many people that still speak the language. So, so that's going to be my last comment to you all, and then I'll open it up to questions, and again, just good attitude, get involved, and be open, learn a little bit about, learn some Navajo as well, and just um, be out there and try to um, make things happen. So, so with that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Now, if you guys have any questions or things that you might be thinking about or whatever it may be and get my, my little opinion about it. So, and it was a real pleasure to talk to each and every one of you today. It made me feel real special today to share a story about me and some of my thoughts and how um, um, thoughts about how um, you're uh, you all are going about your business so yeah hi boo um you do have a question um from jerry begay it says may you share some of your dissertation efforts oh man okay well <clears throat> so <clears throat> hold on, let me get some water I'm going to drink some water because it'll take another 30 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, so my dissertation is, um, um, I definitely wanted to try to figure out, because um, my undergrad was in construction, my MBA, and then, um, uh, so the, the goal behind my dissertation was trying to figure out, at first I was going to try to do a study on maybe the Navajo Nation, whether it was language, whether it was uh, how to improve the nation, or something, something, that, something along those lines. But one of the things I, I've always really been passionate about is empowering people to be good at their jobs, to be to be able to do the things that they need to do and feel good about it, and not wonder if they're doing their jobs right. So my dissertations on project management, employee standardization for interchangeability across states. So um, my study is on how, what are the gaps, performance gaps, whether it's knowledge, motivation, and organizational gaps that really um, hinders an organization as far as standardizing employees to really know their jobs because all of us have held jobs and we always feel really good when we know what we're doing, right? <laughs> So you know what you're doing and you know the task at hand and the organization gives you the tools that you need to be successful. And I think that can go a long ways too. And I feel like what, what, I'll, what I'm getting out of this whole study too is trying to figure out, um, especially, um, so I started my dissertation before the pandemic and I was thinking about interchangeability across states. And this is before the whole remote work started going and trying to before the whole Zoom stuff was really happening, was trying to figure out how do we standardize employees for interchangeability? Like he can take one employee from Florida to Texas to Arizona, and they're comfortable, they're happy, and they can perform and do their jobs. So that's kind of the focus of my study is really empowering the employee. How do we empower the employee to do, to be successful? Because um, that's kind of really brings joy to me is when, you show somebody how to do their job and you don't even have to worry about it again. <laughs> so, yep. So Jerry, hopefully that answers your question. It looks like uh, Cordero Holmes raised his hand. Cordero, do you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. Um, thank you for choosing me. 
uh, I'd like to know what your self-talk was prior to you uh, attending college and entering into the city after you initially left uh, Navajo? Okay, that's a really good question. Uh, the the self-talk was, um, man, it's hot. It's really hot and um, I'm not really strong and I'm digging out the trench and um, I have an opportunity. Um, I really want to try to figure out how can I help my people? How can I, there's a, there's gotta be a bigger purpose. There's gotta be a bigger purpose. My mom would always say, um, um, help yourself because somebody's not going to always be there to help you. So learning how to be independent. And I felt like when I made that trip to Phoenix on my own, I felt like I was preparing myself for a journey that really is going to be the journey within yourself and your own and knowing that um, it can be done and you can, and something is looking over you and you got a nation behind you to figure out how just, I think just that mindset that you're going to do something good for your people and that this is bigger than that. And I remember thinking that driving down to Phoenix, cause man, I was scared. I didn't have no relatives, no friends, didn't know nobody and didn't know Phoenix. And I was just like, at that time you just had to, I had a flip phone and I was like, okay, well, let's try it out. And if I treat people the way I treat people back home as a relative or as a, as a friend through the clan system, then I should be all right. So it's kind of the approach that I took. Thanks. Thanks for ask, asking that question. That's a good one. I have a question. Hi, Bo. This is um, Carmi um, Blackwater Hall again. I don't know if you remember me, but I graduated with you in the class of 2006 at Red Mesa. Um, my company, I started a nonprofit just recently, and I was wanting to know is NECA going to be helping with assisting like nonprofits with like um, fundraising or anything like that in the future, or are they currently doing that right now? <clears throat> That's a good, good hey, got hey. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello, Red Mesa. <laughs> yes. Thanks for joining. I'm really excited to hear that you're, you started your own nonprofit and it sounds like a really nice journey to get things moving. And as far as NECA, I think um, one of the things that we focus on is definitely because we still operate as a contractor. So we tried to figure out um, like you have programs like Division of Community Development that have uh, projects that they're looking at, NTUA is looking at projects and IHS and a lot of these organizations have construction needs. So what we do is we just try to take the approach of how can we help you build your projects? And we haven't really gone on to the other side, of like being an owner's representative or mm -hmm. trying to find projects in the forefront. It's more of just trying to help existing entities be successful. And I think that's where it comes uh, in my talk earlier. I was saying that when you, when you ask, when you reach out to people, and you say, I want to make you look good, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of how we started those discussions with uh, Division of Community Development, Economic Development, and NTUA, and, and those organizations. And we've always approached them like, hey, we want to make you look good. We want to help you out with whatever your problems are. Even though we're just a construction company, we don't mind having those conversations. So no, we haven't really worked with, well, maybe IHS if they're nonprofit. <laughs> well, they are nonprofit, but we just do a lot of their water lines and stuff. So. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Okay, Boo, it looks like we have another person. Um, Peter Deswood has a question. Morning, Boo. Hey, so I like the I like your discussion, and um, thank you, Change Labs, for for having this uh, meeting. So I know in the in the twenty eighteen election, there was a huge number of millennials who voted on, on the Navajo Nation, right? They said there was a high turnout from Phoenix. A lot of people came back from Phoenix, Albuquerque, these metropolitan areas and impacted the, the vote, right? So a lot of times people were saying that, um, you know, the millennial population uh, wasn't really in tune with the issues that were going on in the Navajo Nation. So moving forward, how do you think we can, we can prevent that from happening? I think it's a real good question. 
I think it's, um, I think the way you do it is, especially with like today's technology, right? Yeah, yeah, you're able to, you should be able to know your candidates, right? You should be able to know your candidates where they stand issues. And I think there needs to be an outlet to really uh, being back home, right? Because I, I, I sit in a lot of those, those, those meetings, uh, some of those discussions. And one of the things that I've noticed too, was there's really a non- um, no one really talks too much about the issues, like what's really happening, what's really happening in the background, right? There's really no, there's really no like um, um, sources to say this is, these are the problems, this is what's going on, this is how we're measuring what's going on, these, these have been the issues, this, this is how long has it, it's been addressed, and I think back to your question too is you need more debates or discussions, right? You need to be able to know how can somebody actually talk about issues that are related to the topics being discussed. So it's open, right? So you want you really want to hear people's thoughts on how they would actually approach and fix things. And I think maybe in the coming elections or coming coming elections, yeah, to really just try to keep keep people that are running running for political positions accountable by getting to know them say, hey, this is what I think, this is what I think is happening, and this is how I would approach it, and really just keep it content-based. I don't know how you can do that, but it'd be nice to just have it all content and really talk about the issues at hand, because yeah, you're right, there's, like earlier in my discussions, I mentioned all the challenges that we're still, we're, we're faced with today and into the future, and some of the other things too is like revenue challenges, and I'm and I'm and I feel very fortunate as a nation too, right? We got government support. The last year we got 714 million from the government to help us out, and that's all formula based, right? We were given money based on a formula just because we're a tribal nation. Here you go, here's 714 million, and then even the new funding that that are coming, the American Recovery Act, is all formula based and the size of our tribe and. And I think that if um, if let's say let's say government funding goes away, right? What what is our plan? What is our plan? And what is your plan? And whatnot? And I think those are real questions to ask because there's things like the closure of NGS Peabody and there's potentials of I've heard gaming and other enterprises and things like that are just that are constantly declining to where what are we doing to I know. Change Labs and other organizations like the Net Chamber, they're interested in trying to help the private economy because and outside of the nation, that's what runs the government and runs the nation or areas is the private economy. And on the nation, it's the complete opposite. So just things like that, I think um, keeping open discussions and debates and really getting real answers would be, uh, um, would be good. Great. Well, thank you for those questions. Uh, we are over on time. Thank you so much, Boo, for sharing and doing this presentation today. We appreciate you being part of our webinar series at Change Labs. And I just want to announce that in two weeks, on April 21st, I will actually be leading a discussion on, I have a business idea. What do I do next? So as you know, um, our incubator at Change Labs, we provide a lot of uh, services to small business owners, and I will be sharing some information on what you can do if you want to start a small business. Uh, we definitely have resources that we want to share with everybody. So we look forward to seeing you in two weeks um, at the next webinar. Thank you all for joining. Um, this, this is being recorded, and so it should be uploaded to the Change Labs YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. So you, if you know of somebody who would like to watch this, um, if you'd like to share this, go to our YouTube channel and it will be uploaded. Thank you again. Again, have a wonderful day.